If everybody would please come in and have a seat. We'll get our worship service started. Remember to pick up your communion cups now so that you'll have them available when we do the Lord's Supper. It's, uh, it's good to have everybody here this morning, especially those who are visiting with us. And if you would uh, fill out an, a visitor's card of those who are visiting, we would certainly appreciate it. And uh, just drop that visitor card in the collection plate at the back when you, when you leave. Order of our services this morning. Our song leader is Daniel Hall. Our opening prayer is Richard Chandler. Our closing prayer is Daniel Bates. And our communion today will be led by Mark Little. Have a few on our, our sick list that we need to mention. Um, Mackenzie Howard has RSV, so remember her. Beverly Adams also was uh, Noted as not feeling well this morning, and she's not here. Rick Chandler, as uh, most of us already know, has been diagnosed with cancer of the salivary gland, and uh, he is in Decatur Hospital at the moment, and he's uh, waiting to see an oncologist. So certainly remember Rick Chandler and and uh, that family, if you would. Uh, also in that family is Cheryl Reed, whose uh, infection didn't clear up with antibiotics, and she had surgery on Tuesday, and she is recovering well. So that's, that's good to hear. Amy Bates is suffering from shingles. She's here with us this morning. That's great. Uh, Tony Anderson had his um, shot treatment on Tuesday, and he's doing good from that. Carolyn Williams has swelling in her lymph nodes and has been given, that's been giving her uh, pain and discomfort, and she's uh, waiting on a, a biopsy to do a biopsy. Is that right? Okay. James Uthold has been sick this week, but he is better. And uh, I would mention that uh, my wife Sarah is uh, going to radiation on Tuesday. I think kind of as a preliminary um, office visit and uh, hopefully and it probably she'll be taking radiation sometime this week. We don't know yet. Mark and uh, Stephanie will be out of town this coming week. They'll be on vacation. So we wish them a, a good trip. Paul and Cherie Jones uh, invite you to join them in renewing their vows in celebration of their 50th wedding anniversary. That renewal will take place at 2 o'clock Saturday, November the 11th at Tanner Church of Christ. And there will be a reception to follow. So remember that. Put that on your calendars. There'll be a gift card shower for Wayman and Cameron Perry. They are expecting, and they're going to make up a gift card basket for them. And uh, if you would, please give your gift cards to Amy Bates and do that by November the 12th, which I believe is two weeks away. There's going to be a ladies' Bible class <clears throat> entitled... Uh, Keeping Your Balance, and this class will begin uh, next Sunday at 9.30, and they will be meeting in the, the fellowship hall in the back. That's a ladies' Bible class, remember that. There's also a special contribution today, and uh, if you would, it is for the um, payment for the HVAC systems in the church building that we had replaced and um, to offset that cost and to pay back a, an internal loan that we've made, we need to have a, another contribution uh, collection for that. And if you would, 
when you make your checks out, make it, pay, uh, make it payable to, to Tanner Church of Christ, but it, in the remarks, put that it is for the AC replacement and just put it in the uh, collection plate at the back. And thank you for the contributions you've already made and the contributions you'll make today. Today is fifth Sunday, and this is our normal fellowship Sunday. We'll have a fellowship meal after the morning worship, and then we will conclude the day with our young people leading us in a short worship service at 1245. Our young ladies will be doing a service for the women in the Hispanic room at 1230. And um, in the closing prayer, we would ask that uh, prayer be made for the food that we're about to partake of, and, and uh, after that we'll assemble in the back and have a good meal. Any other announcements we need to make? Richard, would you lead us in our opening prayer? you bow with me, please. Almighty God in heaven, we approach your throne this morning in the most humble way that we know how. Acknowledge in thee, dear Heavenly Father, the creator of all things in heaven and earth. We thank you most of all for loving us to the extent that you're willing for your son to come to this earth, to live uh, the life of, that he lived, the blood that he shed, that we might have the hope of eternal life abiding in us as we obey, obey your will. Our Father, as we approach your throne this, this morning, we pray especially for those that our brother mentioned from the, from the pulpit, those who are hospitalized, as well as those who are having health problems. We ask you, Father, that they might lean upon you for comfort and that we might comfort them with the words wherewith we are comforted. That is the word of the Holy Word that you've granted unto us, the Bible. Our Father, we thank you for our elders. Thank you for the leadership that they provide. Thank you for our deacons and the office that they fill so very much, so well. Our Bible teaches, Father, we realize that a strong congregation depends upon those who will teach the Bible to our young people and to our adults from Lord's Day to Lord's Day. Our Father, we thank you so much and we sometimes are remiss as we think about our congregation and how it's, how it's existed here in this place for over 100 years that there were those brothers and sisters in Christ from times past who held up that banner of, the, of, of your Lord and upheld the cross. And today we enjoy this congregation as a result of their dedication to that which is right. And dear Heavenly Father, we pray that if, <clears throat> your son, if you de delay your son, your son coming back to, uh, for us that we might a hundred years from now be recognized as a, as a congregation those who grace these pews from time to time uphold their truth and go about preaching the gospel that is able to save our souls our father we ask you this morning to be with with mark as he delivers unto us a, a lesson from your word our father we thank you for his family for stephanie for being such a helpmate to him as he endeavors to fulfill the, the work of the ministry here in our congregation. Our Father, we pray that you might continue to bless us. We attempt to, uh, to worship you in song, and thank you for, D for Danny and <clears throat> his ability to do so. And may we sing with the, with the spirit and with the understanding and being, being strengthened as we listen to each one sing those wonderful words that indeed produce happiness in our hearts. Thank you again, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.
Our first song this morning is number 203. 203. <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Man of sorrows, what a name! For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah! What a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a savior guilty vile and helpless we Spotless Lamb of God was He, full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior, lifted up was He to die, it is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. Number 621. 621. We'll sing all four verses of this song, followed by the chorus, only after the fourth verse. And on verse 3, I'd like to ask for the ladies only to sing that verse. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. Verse 2. Upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. Ladies only, please. For mercy cry, the cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die. 
Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Number 742. 742, verses 1, 2, and 5. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. That charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing. my soul, my life, my own. Please mark number 511 in your songbooks if you wish to use the book. It will be sung at the appropriate time. I'll be reading 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 through 17. It is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ, because there is, no, there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share that one loaf. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everybody. Y'all here this morning? Good morning. Good to see everybody. 1 Corinthians 10, we'll be there in just a moment, but Luke 22 is our text for today. So lots of reading. I want to encourage you to turn there at this time. If you're visiting here with us, then we are honored that you are here and hope that you come back every opportunity that you have. We're glad that you are here and you came at the right time. Not that there's a wrong time to come, but you came when there's food. And so it is the right time to be here, right? I hope y'all stick around at lots of food and fellowship. We always have a good time uh, getting to know each other, cutting up. And uh, of course, the, the women always outdo themselves here and the food will be delicious. So I hope that you stick around for that. Also, our young men and our young ladies before that will be doing their thing. And uh, we want to support them in that, and they always do a wonderful job. So y'all please stick around. It won't be very long, but be a part of that as well. I can remember as a kid <laughs> wondering sometimes, you know, looking around. And I, I grew up in Decatur at first, and then it was uh, in Lawrence County. But I can remember looking at, 
it was Grant Street at the time, Decatur Church Christ now, and looking around at people and thinking uh, in the assembly of our worship service and thinking, what is everybody so sad about, you know? Did y'all ever wonder that? And if you grew up in the church, you might have wondered that. And the thing is that it's not that they were sad. It's that it was very serious about what we're doing here. And uh, there's nothing wrong with smiling. There's nothing wrong. We, we need to be happy that we're here. Amen. Amen. Need to be happy that we're here, but it is also a time that is solemn. It's serious because we are in the presence of God, our Creator, our Lord and Savior. Uh, we partake of these emblems that, that we're about to in just a moment, and that's something that should be precious to us who are children of God. It should mean something to us, and so it is a serious time as well. And so we never need to forget that. You probably looked in your bulletin this morning and saw the uh, title of the lesson that uh, God is nostalgic. You think, what in the world is that about? Uh, nostalgia can be defined as a yearning for the happiness of a former place or time. And I am nostalgic, big time. You can ask my family that. And I wouldn't say a yearning necessarily for the past it's not that I yearn to live in the past or anything like that, but I am nostalgic in the sense that I do like reminiscing. I do like thinking about things in the past. Uh, with social media today and having your phone on you all the time, there's these things that pop up, and you probably know what I'm talking about on uh, Instagram, on Facebook, that are nostalgic, you know. And if you, it's kind of like what we always joke, Steph and I do, about our phones always listening, you know, and so it knows. Uh, and it is, you know, it's kind of spooky to think about that, but it's also what you view, and then you get more of that, you know. And uh, I had clicked on, tapped on, something having to do with nostalgia, the 80s, you know, and ever since then, you know, I get feeds constantly on that. And uh, talking about clothes that we once wore, and that's kind of funny to look at and think about, the music that we listened to, the movies that we watched, uh, just different things, the, the, the way that we would play, you know, and the equipment that we had, uh, the playground equipment, different things like that. And I like thinking about stuff like that. It takes me back to the good old days. So I am nostalgic in that way. Don't necessarily want to go back there. I wish we could go back there in some ways. I really do. Uh, to a simpler time, but anyway, I am nostalgic. Well, you say, how in the world is God nostalgic? I got to think about this when I saw this definition for it, and it, it is homesickness. So I got to thinking about that. God is homesick, in a sense, for us, His people. Uh, he desires to be with His people. Uh, he desires to be in the hearts of each and every one of us as His people. And so in that sense, God is nostalgic. Uh, you think about it over the years and as you thumb throughout the Bible from Old to New Testament, you see uh, this displayed in a lot of different ways where God will set up something uh, for his people to remember him by, going all the way back to Genesis and, of course, the, the rainbow to remember you know, that God will never destroy the earth again with water. There in the law of Moses, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to remember that God created everything on, in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. And so according to the law of Moses, uh, they were to do that as well. To a pile of rocks there at the Jordan, as they entered into the promised land, they were to stack this pile of rocks up. And each rock, each boulder represented a tribe of God's people. And there was to remind them after they went into the promised land and after they are, uh, have enjoyed having free houses and you know uh, vineyards that they did not plant and crops and everything that they did not plant. And as they uh, fed on all of that, and as they got uh, full, if you will, and happy, not to forget that God was the one that gave them all of that. And so God has always set up things in order for us to remember him and for us to be close to him. And so the Passover is one of those. I want to think a little bit about that today. So going back some 3,400 years or so to a time where Egypt, uh, God's people were there in Egypt, and they've been there for about 430 years in bondage as slaves. And God, uh, through the hand of Moses, has delivered one plague after the other. And so it's finally the tenth plague and the last plague, and that has to do with the death of the firstborn. 
and just a terrible thing. And God tells his people that if you will take the blood of a lamb and put that over the doorpost like that, then uh, the death angel, if you will, will pass over you. And so uh, you can just imagine the anticipation and the fear and the excitement that must have took place that night. Uh, but then the next day, the exodus and freedom from slavery, from so many years of slavery. And so you fast forward some 1,300 years to the time of the Passover. There is probably somewhere around two and a half million people there in Jerusalem for this holy day. And they've come there for this very reason, to partake of this, this feast, this time to remember what God has done on that event. And so the Brook Kidron probably running red from all the blood of, of probably more than 200,000 lambs that would have been slain in order for them to sacrifice. And so they're about to partake of this Passover meal to remember what God had, did for, uh, had done for them and that he freed them from bondage, from slavery. Luke chapter 22, we have Jesus and his 12 disciples and they make their way through the city towards an upper room to celebrate the Passover meal. And that is actually the setting of the institution of the Lord's Supper that we are about to partake this day as we do every Lord's Day, every first day of the week. Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 7 is our text for today. It's a long reading. Please read along with me. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Verse 12, Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he said, had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is finished in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God Come. So just put your, your mark there, and we're going to be back there here, here in just a little bit. And so the Passover is God's delivery, remembering that, that God delivered them from Egyptian bondage, from slavery. And in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, it says something very unusual. It actually refers to Jesus as being our Passover. And so Jesus is the one that has delivered us from not Egyptian slavery, but rather the slavery of sin. And he has done that for us so that we don't have to live in sin. So we don't have to pay the consequences of sin through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 is a very unusual passage. What I want to do is I want to go and look at the elements that was used in the Passover and talk about that and think about the Lord's Supper and then we will talk about those elements and what they mean to us as children of God as we partake of them today. And so, first of all, in this upper room, there was the lamb, the Passover lamb. And the one that God had told Moses and directed him for his people uh, had to be without blemish and without spot. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5 says that. It had to be uh, a sacrifice for them, not just the runt, if you will, but the very best. And so the lamb that was in the upper room that night was none other than the very Son of God. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 that he is, that, that we were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. It calls the very Son of God a lamb. And yes, he was perfect. He committed no sin, yet he was that sacrifice for us. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, you have John the Baptist there, and he had been preaching a, a message about repentance and uh, 
uh, making ready for Jesus Christ. And as Jesus shows up on the scene, if you will, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In Revelation, in chapter 5, and verses 6 through 9, it talks about this lamb. It talks about Jesus being this lamb, referring to him in that sense, and that he was sent in to all the world, and that redemption is through him. It's a beautiful passage. And so the lamb, our lamb, of course, is none other than the sinless Son of God. A second thing that was in that upper room is unleavened bread. The Jewish Passover has always been celebrated without yeast. Unleavened bread. Leaven, yeast, was something that represented something that was evil. It was a symbol for sin, if you will. And so, according to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 19, they were to take all yeast out of their house one full week before the Passover to get all of that out of the house. So any bread that would have been served in the upper room that night was indeed unleavened bread. And so Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. So today when we here in just a moment partake of that bread, that little wafer, that's what that represents, that God in the flesh, his body was broken for us so that we can have redemption so that we can one day be with him. The prophet Isaiah says that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, our punishment was upon him. The apostle Paul says that he knew him who, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Thirdly, in the upper room there was bitter herbs So the Jews would partake of bitter herbs in remembrance of their suffering there in Egypt, in Egyptian bondage. And so it was to remind them of that. The Mishnah, the Jewish Mishnah, that is a recording of of laws and traditions that they had, talks about this and says that they would have things like lettuce and snake root and dandelions uh, were used to commemorate this. And so this reminds us that Jesus suffered for us. The suffering that he took on the cross for our redemption, for our salvation. It also, I think, reminds us of the bitterness of sin in our life and that, that how bad things were before Jesus came into our lives and changed our lives and took care of that sin. This is a very, very special time in our worship service. Our worship is special. Every bit of it. From praying to our God to singing praises to Him, every aspect of our worship service is very important. This is such an important part of our worship service. And so often we don't even think about it. I've been guilty of this myself. It's so easy to think about where we're going for lunch. It's so easy to think about cares of the world. It's so easy to be fumbling with our pocketbook or going through our purse or maybe if we have a child to be tending to that child. And I'm not saying don't tend to your child, but I am asking for you to be serious and to take this very, very seriously as we partake of this each and every Lord's Day. Don't ever be complacent. Don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever forget what we're doing. And some people sometimes will complain about The little cup here, and everybody has a a, a preference, and some people say, why don't we go back to doing it the old way and passing it? And some people say, no, I like this new way. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter how we go about doing it. And, you know, some people say, well, I don't like that wafer on top. Or sometimes it doesn't even have the wafer, right? Sometimes you get a cup that doesn't even have one, and that's just uh, the fault of the company for, for not putting one in there. Sometimes we talk about the grape juice being, well, man, that's, that, that's wine now, you know. That's got a little bit of a bite to it. And that might be the case. But it's what it represents. It's what this stands for. Our salvation, our redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what it represents. And so we need to partake of it in a worthy way. And that is with the right mindset and in the right way. In the upper room that night also was blood. The Jewish lamb was shed for the blood of the atonement for the entire family. And the father was responsible for that. 
The book of Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says, The life is in the flesh, and that is in the blood, and I gave, have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. The word atonement means covering. And so the blood has been given to cover our sins so that our sins will not be in the presence of a holy and a righteous God. The Hebrew writer says in chapter 9 and verse 22, According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Remission is another word for forgiveness. Blood had to be shed in order to have forgiveness and atonement for sin. And Jesus took the cup and Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26 and verse 28. It's His blood that redeems us. It's His blood that justifies us and the sin that we have committed. It's His blood that covers that sin and brings us back into a good relationship with God. The passage that was read just a little bit ago, and I appreciate that, that good reading. Scott did a wonderful job with that. I want you to notice what it says here and the highlighted word there. It says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. That, that word communion there, it means togetherness. It's something that from the very beginning was not done separately, but yet they all came together to do this. We went through a time back a couple years ago through COVID where we did this at home a lot. And we would turn on the computer and we would do this in spirit together, but yet we were separate. And we did the very best that we could. And we did that as well. That's all we could do at the time. We didn't know much about COVID. We didn't know how deadly it was. And so that's what we did. But now we're not in a pandemic anymore. And from the very beginning, this is meant to be koinia. It's meant to be together. It's communion with one another. And so we need to come together to do this. We don't need to, if we're sick, you know, to stay home and partake of that. That's understandable. Absolutely. We're out of town. We're on vacation or something maybe. But we do not need to neglect to come together to partake this because it is to be done together. It is a communion with God. And so we need to make sure that we are his child, first and foremost. If you're not a child of God, uh, then these elements really don't mean anything, you know. And it's probably very strange that we would eat a little piece of bread and drink a little grape juice. But for a child of God, we know what these represent. And it's very, very important. And so we commune with God. We need to make sure, first of all, that we are a child of God, that we have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also that we are striving to be right with God in the way that we live our life that we're not hypocrites, that we're trying our very best. Perfection, absolutely not, because we're saved by the grace of God. None of us can be perfect, but that we're striving our very best. But this communion is also with one another. And so we need to make sure that we're in the right relationship with one another. In other words, we need to make sure that we have not sinned against somebody and not made that right. Make sure that we're treating one another right. So that's what this is talking about here. In the 1940s, this song was penned, uh, Off We Come Together, and it is a beautiful song with the Lord's Supper in mind. And so Daniel, at this time, is about to come up and, and lead us in this song before we partake of the Lord's Supper. And I want you just to notice some of the words. This is uh, verse 2. It says, May we keep in memory all that thou hast said. May we truly worship as we eat the bread. Verse 3, may we all in spirit, all with one accord, take this cup of blessing given by the Lord. And then the chorus says, help, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. So may we all at this time put everything else out of our mind and partake of the Lord's Supper. So Daniel's going to lead us in this song.
If you do not have one of these cups, please raise your hand at this time and we'll be sure to get you one. We're going to take this time to partake of the Lord's Supper and we're going to resume our passage here in, Rev, uh, in Luke chapter 22 in verse 19. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he says, do this in remembrance. It is a memorial. It is a time that has been set aside to remember what Christ has done. And so it's a very important for us, of course, to, to think about that. Um, one of the things that helps me sometimes is, is to read passages uh, having to do with the crucifixion. Uh, however you need to do that to get that on your mind and to put everything else out is very important. The bread represents, of course, the body of Jesus Christ. And just to think about, it represents God becoming flesh. The God that created everything, that spoke everything into existence, that exists outside the parameter of time. God Almighty became flesh and blood. And that he, his life was given so that we can have salvation. So that's what the bread represents. At this time, we'll go to God in prayer and thank him for this. Almighty Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Father, for this time that has been set aside for us to honor Thee and to remember Thee, to show our appreciation for Your love for us. We're thankful, Father, for the bread, for what it represents. We're thankful, Father, for Jesus and His willingness to take on the form of a man, to suffer and die so that we can have redemption. So thankful, Father, for Your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. going to resume with verse 20 of our text. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The cup he's referring to there, of course, is the blood of Jesus Christ. In Matthew's account in verse uh, chapter 26, verse 28, he says, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. His blood, as we've talked about before, is to make atonement for our sins. And it also reminds us that there's nothing that we have to do in order to have forgiveness, except to simply belong to Him, to live for Him. There's nothing that you and I have to do in order to have forgiveness. It's been done already on the cross. He paid for our sins on the cross. All I have to do is simply be a child of God, belong to him, and just try my very best to live for him. I'm going to fall over and over again. 1 John 1 verse 7 is a wonderful passage that talks about when that happens, if I'm willing to just simply turn from that and confess that I've messed up, he's going to continue to cleanse me from that. What a tremendous blessing that is, is it not? So at this time, we're going to go to God in prayer and thank him for the blood of Jesus Christ. Almighty Heavenly Father, we continue our thanksgiving Thanking you, Father, for that cleansing blood. I'm thankful, Father, that of all the ways that, that you could have forgiven our sins, that you chose to do it in this way, showing your love for us. And we ask, Father, your forgiveness, continued forgiveness for our sins. Please help us, Father, to never take this for granted, to never be complacent for this, never to lose its meaning. Please help us to partake of this in the right way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
The Lord's Supper simply recenters us every single week. Every single one of us has so much going on in our lives. And the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week causes us to just hit the pause button for just a little bit. And to think about no matter how bad things may be in our life from time to time, that they're great as a child of God because of what he's done for me. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of this every Lord's Day. Come and be with your brethren. Partake of the Lord's Supper. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we have to remember what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Today, if you're not a child of God, we want to encourage you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you can have the forgiveness of sins. That sacrifice has already been made on the cross for you. All you have to do is obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus says to go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. It's just that simple. Do you believe in Jesus Christ and have you been baptized for the forgiveness of sins? If not, this would be a wonderful opportunity. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?
James 5.16 talks about confessing our faults to one another so that we can pray for one another. And that's what Tony has done. There's nothing special about me in any kind of way. It's not like I'm the Pope or something like that or, uh, or the high priest to confess your sins to. And I just want to say that. He, he can confess. When he's confessing, he's confessing to all of us uh, that he's struggling. And we are a family, we are a spiritual family that pray for each other and help each other out in any way that we can. And Tony is saying that one of the things that he struggles with uh, is sometimes his temper and also having the right kind of heart and keeping his mind on doing, not just going through the motions. And I, I appreciate you for saying that because we all struggle with that and so few of us are willing to admit it and actually do something about it. And I appreciate Tony so much for that. It's so easy, and that's one reason why I wanted to do the Lord's Supper this way today, is because uh, if we don't watch it, it, become, it, it can become meaningless and just going through the motions. And so let's make sure that we are sincere in, in our faith, what we profess, to live it out in our life the very best way that we can. And we're going to fall short when we do, then we pray, pray for each other like this, and he's promised to cleanse us of our sins. And we appreciate Tony and uh, his, his desire to be right with God and, and with his fellow man, with his brethren as well. We love you. We love you. Can I ask uh, Henry at this time to come as one of our shepherds and, and pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here today. We thank you, Father, for the message that, that was brought to us, Father, and help us to attend, attend to the words that, that Mark has taught us, Father, to each and every time that we partake of that which represents our salvation, Father, that we would do so letting our minds go back to the cross and the tragic deed that transpired there, but, but yet precious to us, Father, is the blood of Christ that was shed that we might have forgiveness of our sins through the gospel. Father, we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers, Father. And this time we want to pray for Tony. We know that Tony <coughs> is, a, is a good man, Father. We, we know that the Bible says that none of us are good, no, not one, but that, that's in comparison with you. And, and we know that, that in and of ourselves we can accomplish nothing, Father, as far as our salvation. But we're so thankful that Tony has come uh, acknowledging problems that he has, Father, and we pray that you would be with him. Help, help us all, Father, to, to watch our temper from time to time <clears throat> and any, any other things that might be contrary to your will. But, Father, be with Tony this morning special. Help him to realize that, he, that we love him and that, that you love him most of all, Father, and it is, is the blood of Christ that, that takes care of his sins whenever he confesses that the blood of Christ continues keeps on keeping on washing our sins away. But in Christ's name we pray. Amen. One last thing before being led in our closing prayer. That was a prayer just for Tony. We'll be led in our closing prayer in just a moment when I ask whoever's leading us in closing prayer to, to bless the food again. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that you've been blessed. We've been blessed by your presence and I hope that you stick around and eat with us and uh, just enjoy one another's company. Also, at this time, of course, our contribution is always given in the back. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 talks about on the, on the Lord's Day to, to give as we have prospered. And so uh, if you have a contribution and you can give, please make sure that you do that in the back. Thank you for being here today. We'll be led in our closing prayer. <laughs>